But since the collapses were occurring, had occurred all around the world, codes of practice began to appear elsewhere. Australia in 1993. Uh, Hong Kong's first code, produced by the then Hong Kong Society of Accountants, uh, now the Hong Kong Institute of CPAs, uh, was in 1998. Italy, India, Japan produced their codes at the same time. Russia was amongst some one of the later countries to produce a corporate governance code for its countries in 2001. Then there were codes from international agencies such as the OECD and the World Bank, Commonwealth countries, and some institutional investors uh, produced codes to encourage better corporate governance performance in the companies in which they wanted to invest. But despite the codes, problems persisted into the 21st century. The most dramatic and the one most frequently referred to is Enron. The United States a company, a dramatic collapse, the largest collapse of a US company to that time, although WorldCom was to beat it in terms of scale uh, a year or so later, Enron, on the face of it, followed all of the best corporate governance practices. Unlike most American uh, listed companies, it had actually separated the chairmanship from the chief executive officer. One of the recommendations in the Cadbury Code and now reflected in codes all around the world. Enron did that. Enron also appointed a significant number of outside directors who were genuinely independent of management. It also appointed board committees to do under, undersea, oversee audit, uh, nomination of directors, and directors remuneration. It followed many of the codes to the letter, yet it went dramatically uh, bankrupt, um, largely due to the belief in management that they had invented a new way of managing what was in fact an energy company. More of Enron later. Uh, HIH Insurance in Australia collapsed in the early years of this century. Independent Insurance in the UK, Parmalat, a food company in Italy, Tyco in the USA, fascinating company dominated by one man whose large claim to fame is the huge investment he made in a, a family houses and uh, antique cars, uh, Tompkins in the UK and another USA collapse, Worldcom, based on alleged accounting fraud. By this time, the phrase corporate governance had appeared. The first book to use the title uh, was uh, written something to publish somewhere around uh, the early 1980s. The phrase began to come into use with the arrival of the codes. Sir Adrian Cadbury used the phrase corporate governance in his code. And by 2002, as a response to the Enron collapse, the US decided the codes weren't enough. What they would do is to change company law. And the Sarbanes-Oxley Act of 2002 changed corporate governance in the United States. In fact, the arrival of the Sarbanes and Oxley Act in the United States, as we will see, has introduced a significant divergence between the principles of corporate governance in the United States, which are now based on rules. You obey the rules or you risk penalties or even going to jail. In most of the rest of the world, including Hong Kong, corporate governance is still based on principles. Follow the code, or if for any specific reason in your company, the situation means that it's inappropriate to follow the code, then report to the stock exchange, to your shareholders indeed, to the world at large, that you follow the code with a except for the following reasons. US gone rules, rest of the world stays with principles. We'll have to consider, is there going to be a convergence of corporate governance thinking or will this differentiation remain? 
But to wind up on this uh, first lecture, which I've sought to give an indication of the way thinking has evolved over the years, there are some still remaining questions. Should the chairman ever also be the chief executive officer? The codes say no. The United States, the practice is yes. Should a retiring chief executive officer go on to become chairman, move from the top of management to running the board? The argument for it is, well, what a good idea. He's got all this experience. He has this network of contacts. He knows the business. Of course, it's sensible. The argument against it is that where does that leave the new incoming chief executive officer if his previous boss is now moved into the boardroom? Can outside directors be genuinely independent? Codes, as we will see, call for independent outside or non-executive directors on the board. But if an outside independent director knows very little about the company, what contribution can he make in the boardroom? But the more he knows about the company, the longer he serves on the board, the more value he might be, but the less independent he is. The question is unresolved. How should director's remuneration be determined. Absolutely key issue, which appears in the uh, investigative media all the time. Should shareholders be able to nominate directors? Of course they should, said the original 1855 Companies Act. Uh, that facility, though nominally available, is seldom exercised in today's complex corporate governance world. So should the institutional investors, those are uh, banks, finance houses, pension funds, insurance companies who own slices of our major companies, should they exercise more power? Well, if they do, they would need more information. Why should institutional investors have information that's not available to the other shareholders? And our external audit is really independent. Uh, before Enron, there was uh, the firm Arthur Anderson, then one of the big five audit firms, earned more money from their management consultancy fees with Enron than they did from the audit. Post the Sox Act, Sarbanes and Oxley Act, management consulting has to be separated from the external audit. Arthur Anderson was one of the other casualties of the Enron collapse. The fifth largest international, independent, external auditing firm no longer exists. And we live in a world of complex, dynamic, and often global corporate entities. How are they to be governed? As I said a few moments ago, are governance processes around the world converging? And are the rules that exist now, the rules and recommendations for listed companies, appropriate to family companies, small firms, not-for-profit entities. So I've tried to share with you some int introductory thoughts on the evolution of corporate governance. We've seen that corporate governance is not a new idea. What's new is the phrase. We've seen that it arises whenever there's a separation between managers and owners. We saw the fascinating and e enormously significant arrival of the joint stock limited liability company. We saw the developments through the 20th century, the flirting with two-tier boards and uh, stakeholder ideas. We saw the corporate collapses of the 1980s and the arrival around the world of the codes of good practice, codes and principles and recommendations of corporate governance. And we fed that through to the present day and the most recent corporate collapses around the world, which have led in the case of the United States, to new law, and in the case of the rest of the world, as we will see, to frontier thinking. I look forward to sharing those insights and some ideas with you. Thank you.